Chapter 26 in the Jarvis focuses on assessment of the female genitourinary system. In addition to reviewing normal and abnormal findings and practicing your subjective and objective data collection, focus on the normal changes with aging and how to differentiate those from disease processes of the female GU system. We are going to cover inspection of the skin, lesions and sores and discharge and palpation and internal examination, although these are usually reserved for advanced practice RNs and special practice nurses like OB. When taking your health history, subjective data that should be collected includes the patient's menstrual history, so the age at menarche, which was the onset of menses, what their usual menstrual cycle is like, whether or not they've hit menopause, their last menstrual period, their obstetric history, number of pregnancies, number of live births, number of miscarriages or abortions, any complications during any pregnancies. Ask about um, self-care behaviors, such as annual gynecological checkups, Definitely pap tests if they've ever been sexually active is critical as well. Talk to them about pelvic pain or discomfort that they may be having with or without intercourse. Examine urinary symptoms that would be indicative of a urinary tract infection. Uh, very similar to the male urinary assessment. Uh, urgency, frequency, burning, nocturia, hematuria, changes in color or smell of urine, and any um, incontinence. All of that would be important to document. When talking to a patient about vaginal discharge, it's important to ask about the color, the consistency, the smell, and if there's any irritation of the tissues or any pain anywhere in the pelvic region. Ask about the past uh, history in terms of uh, genital um, sexually transmitted infections, genital issues, surgeries, sores, lesions, um, any problems with uh, ovaries, cysts, uh, endometriosis, anything like that. Talk to the person about being sexually active. Are they in a sexual relationship? Um, and then, you know, our concerns are safety and understanding what their relationship is to help us guide our assessment. Keep in mind that these are only questions that are pertinent if you're doing a full history. It's not questions that you would ask someone if they came in with a knee injury or were there for uh, pneumonia, inpatient with pneumonia. Ask about contraceptive use and what type they're using. Um, again, sexually transmitted infections and whether or not they have any signs or symptoms and then help provide some education to reduce the risk of future uh, infection transmission. Your objective assessment is going to include inspection of the external genitalia. If there are complaints, you would palpate the labia and the skein and Bartholin glands. Again, advanced practice nurses would use a vaginal speculum to inspect the cervix and the vagina. Any nurse can obtain specimens for cytologic study. By manual examination of the cervix, uterus, and adnexa, is typically reserved for advanced practice nurses um, unless you're an OB nurse doing a cervical check on a laboring patient. Rectovaginal examination is usually reserved for advanced practice nurses. And then testing stool for occult blood um, as a way to screen for colorectal cancer.
positioning. So during questioning, the woman should be seated. And then during the exam, the lithotomy position is the ideal position to access both the uh, vagina and the rectum if you're doing both exams at once. You've probably seen this before, uh, but ideally you have uh, the feet in the stirrups and then have them scoot down so that the uh, buttocks are almost hanging off the end of the bed. So they need to kind of breach the end of the bed. And then you want them to just relax the bottom into the bed. So kind of allow the knees to drop out to the side and relax the pelvic floor muscles. Begin with an external inspection of the genitalia, looking at the skin, hair, and normal external structures. And note any obvious um, deformities, lesions, discharge. Using a gloved hand, separate the labia and examine the clitoris, the urethra, the vaginal opening, the perineum, and the anus. And again, we're looking for any abnormal uh, lesions, sores, uh, any discharge, any growths, um, any swelling, any evidence of trauma. If there are abnormal findings, you would want to palpate them and then document the size, the shape, the location, just like as you would any other lesion. If you're performing a speculum exam, you would also palpate the vaginal opening and assess muscle tone prior to insertion of the speculum. The speculum examination of the internal genitalia is used to look at the cervix and the os. And remember the os is the opening of the cervix. Normally, the cervical mucosa is pink and very even colored and, and pretty much smooth. Um, during the second month of pregnancy, it may take on a slightly bluish or congested looking color, um, which is called Chadwick's sign. Uh, I've had quite a number of OBGYN doctors tell me that this is not a very common finding. Uh, after menopause, the mucosa appears uh, more pale than pink due to um, atrophy. The position of the cervix should be midline and it could be anterior or posterior and um, it can project anywhere from one to three centimeters into the vaginal opening. The diameter of a normal cervix is roughly an inch and then the os should be um, pretty small and round prior to pregnancy or delivery. So if the cervix has never dilated, it should be pretty small and round. And women who've had a vaginal delivery, um, once the cervix has dilated, it never fully closes back down. So it becomes more horizontal. And um, if there were lacerations uh, or trauma, it may um, show those old scars or injuries on the surface of the cervix. You can note on the, the surface of the cervix that um, it, there might be eversion or ectropion after vaginal deliveries. The endocervical canal um, might be averted, looking kind of uh, red or having like a beefy halo inside the pink cervix surrounding the oz. It might be difficult to distinguish um, this, which is a normal variation from an abnormal condition, so a biopsy may be needed or a colposcopy. And then there are things called nebothian cysts, which are benign growths, and those appear on the cervix after childbirth. Um, they're small, they're pretty smooth, kind of yellow looking nodules. Uh, there might just be one or multiple, and they're essentially retention cysts, which means that they're just kind of holding on to fluid and it's due to an obstruction of cervical glands. So where the cervix is normally excreting um, uh, lubrication and a little bit of mucus, the um, 
Nebothian cysts are basically like little sacs of uh, cervical fluid. If there are a lot of secretions within the uh, vaginal vault, um, and, you know, blood or uh, like STI and uh, secretions, I use a large um, uh, swab and just kind of uh, sponge that up and, and throw it away. Um, so sponge away secretions to have a better view of those internal structures. Uh, structures. So uh, we use uh, Q-tips that are um, like roughly the size of your thumb usually to kind of pick those up. So those are large uh, cotton tip applicators. So just to get an idea of what a normal cervix would look like, um, a nullip in the upper left-hand corner is gonna have a small type, tight round oz. And then after childbirth on the upper right-hand corner, you're gonna have a more lateral um, opening. Uh, you might have evidence of healed lacerations, uh, which are the, that kind of middle line. And then cervical eversion is that bottom left and then nebothian cysts bottom right. So these are all normal findings. Um, these would all be uh, normal variations depending on the baseline for the patient while doing an exam. Um, there are two different types of speculums that you might come across. Uh, one is um, uh, narrow and the other one is kind of um, spoon bill, kind of wide. The narrow one is used for nullips and the wider one is used for um, anybody who's had a child um, because uh, of, actually because of this exactly, but the, the inside of the, um, the vaginal vault as well has a kind of more and loose tissue after delivery. And so you need kind of a wider speculum to move all that tissue out of the way and really visualize the cervix after delivery. Uh, in your book, it also talks about the HPV vaccine. And this is probably some critical um, teaching that you're going to do or education with both uh, parents and patients. So it is now recommended for girls and boys starting at the age of 11. And it's a series of three injections within a six month period. It protects both boys and girls from the development of different types of cancers. Uh, right now in our baby boomers, we're seeing a huge increase <clears throat> in different types of cancers like oral and rectal cancers that are related to HPV. As long as people are getting pap smears, the incidence of cervical cancer remains fairly low because it takes a long time. It takes years to move from an ascus, which is like an abnormal uh, early stage abnormal pap to an actual uh, full-blown cervical cancer. The problem becomes when people don't get routine screening, uh, but people don't get routine, you know, rectal paps or esophageal paps or oral paps, and that's the problem. So people are regularly going to their doctor and getting checkups and going to the dentist and getting checkups and, you know, going to their GYN and getting checkups. A lot of these cancers can be caught early, especially if people are asked the right questions and report the right symptoms. So we know that this virus causes cancer. So some abnormalities that you might find during your examination of the external genitalia would be things like um, pubic lice, which would be pediculosis pubis, which are referred to as crabs. Um, you might see herpes or syphilis sores. Uh, contact dermatitis, which it presents as a red rash, and that could be from moisture, it could be from yeast, it could be from irritation, it could be folliculitis uh, from ingrown hairs. <clears throat> it could actually even be a strep or staph infection. Um, so uh, you want to keep an eye on that as well. Um, HPV warts can be present, and remember that that's kind of the low risk. Um, but the, those are concerning, and those are the skin-colored, fleshy kind of cauliflower-shaped uh, um, papules. Uh, urethritis, so if the urethra itself is red and inflamed and has a little bit of a discharge, that would be an indication that the person might have an infection. We'd want to test for that. And remember, if you suspect urethritis, you should do a dirty urine versus a clean urine to really catch any evidence of uh, gonorrhea or chlamydia. Um, Bartholin's gland, 
uh, sometimes abscesses and uh, you have a noticeable swelling or shift and then you can also palpate it. And then you can get a caruncle on the urethra and that can be notable just on inspection and is definitely something that you can palpate and feel as well. Inside, um, you can get a cystocele, a rectocele, or a uterine prolapse. And these are, um, the cystocele is when the bladder is prolapsing into the vagina. The rectocele is when the rectum is prolapsing into the vagina. And the uterine prolapse is when the uterus is prolapsing down into the vagina. And there are pictures of these in your book on page 766. Um, you may have had encountered patients before that use pessaries to help keep the vagina up and um, all of those structures in place. There's also surgeries that are available to fix those problems. So I think it's important to note that postmenopausal vaginal bleeding is never okay and should always be investigated further. You should consider it cancer until proven otherwise. And the two big cancers that we worry about are uterine and cervical. So when you go in and you do your assessment, so this is the speculum uh, cervical exam, some things that you might see that would be changes or abnormalities of the cervix one would be cyanosis or a bluish discoloration of the cervix. And as I mentioned, sometimes that that's normal during pregnancy, but it's abnormal when you have um, a cancer or some sort of venous uh, congestion, like a pelvic tumor. You may also see it in patients who are in heart failure, or um, if the person has significant hypoxia, the cervix itself will be blue, just like nail beds. The area around the os can become eroded uh, and that um, is uh, typical, you know, more with age, uh, but should be investigated further to make sure that it's not disease. HPV, which is also referred to as condylomata, um, is kind of the pre-cancer stage. Uh, and again, you can enhance the visibility of HPV lesions with uh, vinegar or with Lugol's, which is a strong iodine solution. Polyps can emerge from the cervical os, um, and so it looks like there's the os is slightly dilated and that there's tissue emerging from the os. And then uh, people that are kind of my generation um, uh, and, and older, so in the 1940 to 1970, some pregnant women were given uh, DES um, for uh, nausea, and this caused um, some uh, fetal deformities um, of their developing fetus. So uh, there are some women out there that still have abnormal um, cervixes. Then there's cervical cancer. So this is a carcinoma and the picture of this is on page 767. So you can see the difference between like HPV, which would be um, like a uh, anywhere from an ascus, which is just like a kind of an, an abnormal um, pap smear all the way up to uh, carcinoma. Um, this is a, a definite discoloration um, of the cervix at this point in time and you see like deformity and you see um, uh, some ulceration as well. Uh, when when this happens, um, you know, we're talking hysterectomy kind of uh, treatment. The other thing that we would do if we went in and we we suspected uh, vaginal bleeding and we went in and the cervix itself looked normal is we would do an endometrial biopsy where we inserted a catheter up into the uh, uterus and took a sample of the endometrium itself to check for endometrial cancer. So you can't be too serious like there's no way to be too serious. You can't be serious enough, I should say, about uh, postmenopausal vaginal bleeding. Some other conditions that you should be aware of would be atrophic vaginitis, which occurs in postmenopausal women, whether it is surgical, medical, or age-related. And this is where you have um, thinning of the epithelial lining of the vagina, 
Uh, abrasions are common during intercourse. They might have some bleeding after decreased lubrication um, and intercourse tends to be more painful. In addition to that, um, there's usually some uterine atrophy changes that occur as well. Uh, candidiasis, a yeast infection in the vaginal area usually presents with a really thick, um, yeasty, uh, white, clumpy discharge, um, and it has that kind of uh, sour smell to it. Trichomoniasis is um, a yellowy, green, very frothy, foul-smelling discharge. Um, and on cervical exam, there's petechiae uh, internally on the cervix. Um, bacterial vaginosis, uh, Gardnerella specifically, has a very gray, kind of drippy discharge that smells like fish. Uh, when you do a wet prep slide, like you do the KOH. Um, chlamydia is one of those kind of uh, silent infections where until the person develops PID and has that terrible unilateral rebound tenderness, shuffling gait, uh, doubling over, a lot of times they don't know that they have it. Um, so if there's any uh, kind of yellow uh, discharge at all, they should be tested for chlamydia. Um, especially uh, people who have multiple partners, a change in partner, or have unprotected sex should be routinely screened like at their annual exams for chlamydia and gonorrhea because the consequence of not treating chlamydia is infertility. And then uh, gonorrhea also uh, may or may not have discharge, um, also has like some dysuria, and then um, may have some breakthrough bleeding uh, abscesses for Bartholin and skein gland um, are more common with gonorrhea infections, but most people are pretty asymptomatic. So it's important to um, test them routinely and for anybody that you suspect has PID. The uterus can become enlarged during pregnancy or if there's some sort of a, a fibroid or myoma or a lesion, um, if there's endometrial cancer or with an overgrowth of the normal cells and endometriosis. Adnexal enlargement, so that's when you do the bimanual exam. So um, one hand in the vagina and one hand pressing on the external surface of the abdomen and you're feeling for like the ovaries and the tubes um, so you can have a mass in the tubes inflammation of the tubes pelvic inflammatory disease ectopic pregnancies ovarian cysts um, ovarian cancer all of those things would be concerning uh, if there was adnexal enlargement and some other things that you should be aware of is that sometimes uh, children are born with what we refer to as ambiguous genitalia, where genetically they would be male or female, but external genitalia were not fully developed in utero, and it's hard to, to uh, visualize whether or not the fetus is male or female. <clears throat> Um, and then it is possible for children to develop vulvovaginitis, um, and this could be from um, sexually transmitted infections, especially in sexual assault cases, uh, foreign bodies from self-exploration, uh, yeast infections in children with um, juvenile onset diabetes, and uh, then you know uh, wearing uh, wet bathing suits. Um, and uh, usually the causative agent uh, will be a respiratory or a bowel pathogen, so things like uh, E. coli um, are pretty common.